Uh, do you ever feel like your life is a battle? Do you ever feel like that? Well, you're not wrong. Life is a battle. Matter of fact, throughout the scriptures, we repeatedly see that there are these two kingdoms in conflict, all right? You've got the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light. You've got the kingdom of the devil versus the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. You've got the kingdom of, you could call it condemnation versus the kingdom of salvation. Matter of fact, in the book of Colossians, it says that when you give your life to Jesus Christ, he rescues you from the dominion of darkness and brings you into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom there is redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So you're rescued from one kingdom to the other. You change citizenship. At one point, you were a citizen of the kingdom of darkness, and now you're a citizen of the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of love, the kingdom of redemption. But these two kingdoms are in conflict with one another. Reminds me of a scene uh, in Lord of the Rings. Anyone Lord of the Rings fan? Okay, we can nerd out. All right. But there's this one scene, there's this king. Okay, his name's Theoden, and he's king of Rohan. All right, super nice guy, loves his people, but he's a little timid. All right, but then there's this other guy named Aragorn. He comes up, he's kind of the heroic figure in the story. He comes up to him and he's, he's encouraging him to engage in the war. There's a battle all around you, engage in it. To which the king says, I shall not risk open war. To which Aragorn replies, open war is upon you whether you risk it or not. Welcome to Trinity Bible Church. Open war is upon you, <laughs> whether you risk it or not. There are two kingdoms in conflict, and you're all up in it. My beloved, you're either building one or the other with your life. Now, the good thing is, God, of course, doesn't leave us alone. You're a soldier. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you're a soldier in the kingdom of God. You're a soldier in the army of the Lord. Right? But he also didn't leave us alone. He gave us armor. Pastor Eric talked about that last week. Did such a great job going through that passage, talking about all the armor of God that he's given us and how to stand firm in it. So last week, Pastor Eric talked about how to stand firm with the armor of God. This week, we're going to talk about how to advance God's kingdom through prayer. Let me show you. Turn to the book of Ephesians, would you please? Ephesians chapter six, we'll begin at verse 18. If you haven't been with us, we've been going line by line through this whole book, and this is our last message from the book of Ephesians that started all the way back in the fall. So we're gonna wrap up the book today. As you're finding that passage in Ephesians six, let me remind you of a story, maybe you remember it. It's in the book of Exodus chapter 17. If you're not familiar with that, that book's called Exodus because the Israelites are exiting out of Egypt, right? They've been enslaved for a long time. Now they're exiting out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea, that famous story. And after they cross the Red Sea, the very first group of people to attack them are called the Amalekites, all right? So the Amalekites attack the Israelites after crossing the Red Sea. By the way, just because you've been set free doesn't mean that the battles stop. Amen? Okay, so they've been set free, but the battles continue. The Amalekites attack them, and here's how they decide to fight. And in Exodus 17, it's clear that there's this guy named Joshua, General Joshua. He's down in the bad, uh, valley battling with a sword, right? But Moses decides to go up on the mountaintop to pray. And as long as Moses has his hands lifted up, the Israelites are winning, but when he gets tired and puts his hands down, the Israelites start to lose. So his, his brother and another dude, a guy named Aaron, another dude named her, it's not H-E-R, it's H-U-R, okay? He's not trans, it's her, that's his name. All right, <laughs> so they go up and they lift his arms up above his head like this so he can pray. And as long as he's got his arms up in prayer, they win. That's how we fight our battles. With prayer on the mountaintop and the sword in the valley. We pray and we wield the sword of the spirit, the word of God. In this battle between kingdoms, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, we win our battles through prayer and the sword of the spirit. May I show you? This is how to pray. Could, you, could your prayer life use a little help this morning? How is your prayer life? Could it use a little refresher? If so, would you let this passage be that to you this morning, please? Here's what it says. With every prayer and request, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be alert with all perseverance and every request for all the saints. And pray in my behalf that speech may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness 
the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, this is a primer on how to pray as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Let's go take it phrase by phrase, all right? That's how we like to do it around here. Join me, please. So the first phrase we see is, with every prayer and request. With every prayer and request. You see, beloved, may I remind you, not every prayer has to be a gimme, gimme kind of prayer. It doesn't have to be an asking kind of prayer. Now, we do get to ask. Jesus taught us you can ask and seek and knock. Nothing wrong with that. The reason why we get to ask is because God is a good, good father. But may I remind you as your brother, God is not your grandpa, right? God does not exist to spoil you rotten. That's grandpa's job. Amen. All right. <laughs> God is not your grandpa. There are other kinds of prayers besides asking prayers. I was taught a long time ago the acrostic, A-C-T-S, Acts adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then supplication. And then try that. Or read through the Psalms. There's all kinds of prayers in the Psalms. There's all kinds of prayers. It doesn't have to be just asking prayers. Matter of fact, uh, I think one of the aims of praying isn't just to get, it's to lose. Let me explain it this way. I read a story about these two friends, two men, they worked together. One was a Christian and one was a skeptic, all right? And uh, they were... They worked long enough and became friends enough that they could have a bit of an open dialogue about life and even spirituality. And so the skeptic approaches his Christian friend and says, man, I got a question. What have you gained from all that praying you do? And the Christian friend took a moment and thought about it and said, you know, I'll be honest with you, really not that much. But let me tell you all that I've lost. I've lost my anger my bitterness, my depression, my anxiety, and the fear of death. Whew. You see, beloved, sometimes the aim of praying isn't to get, it's to lose. It's to let go. And if I'm being completely honest with you, this is a regular cadence in my life. First thing in the morning, I get up out of bed, make the bed. By the way, children, make your bed. All right, get up, make your bed, go to the bathroom, then I go sit in the special chair I have, and I start to pray. And here's the image that comes to mind when I begin to pray, first thing. I'm not doing gimme, gimme prayers, all right? It's a purging prayer. Uh, I got this image when I used to scuba dive a long time ago. Anybody scuba diver? Okay, it's just, there's just a magical world under the surface. Not around here, because you can't see, all right? But go, go to some place with clear water, and it's this whole world that God's created underneath the surface, it's just amazing. Okay. When you uh, go scuba diving, if you've never done it, you have this device called a regulator that helps you breathe underwater, all right? Sometimes though, because water pressure gets really heavy down there, water can seep into your regulator and that's problematic because I don't know if you know this, we don't breathe water, all right? And so what you have is this button on the bottom or on the outside, it's called a purge button. So you hit the button like this and it purges all the water out of your regulator. Now you can breathe. Honestly, that's the image that comes to my mind almost every morning as I go to the Lord in prayer. It's like, Lord, my heart. I've, uh, I've allowed my heart to be polluted by the stuff of this world. I've given into coveting. I'm jealous. I'm selfish. I'm impatient. And I just need a gush of your Holy Spirit to come into my life and purge out everything that's in me that doesn't belong. Fill me with your spirit so that I can be heart ready for the day ahead of service. That's how I begin my day. With every prayer and request. That's how I begin my day. All right. Are you with me? With every prayer and request, not just requesting prayers, all kinds of prayers, pray. Then secondly, second phrase, pray at all times. Pray at all times. You mean like all the time? Yep. God repeats this, matter of fact. God does not have dementia. He does not repeat himself by accident, 
all right? He repeats himself on purpose. Let me show you another passage that says the same thing. The Bible could not be any clearer that this is what God wants us to do. 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice always. Here it is, pray without ceasing. Pray and keep on praying, don't stop. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. It is God's will for you that you pray nonstop. You pray and keep on praying. Now, now, if you're like me, you're like, man, how do I do that? Because, you know, you got to eat and you got to sleep and you got to work and you got to play and, you know, how do you pray all the time? It's, it's almost like this uh, impossible, burdensome command. You can look at it that way. But then the Lord, I think, really ministered to me as I was chewing on this and just sort of flipped it around. May I do that with you right now? I'd like to flip that command around and for us to look at it this way. Hey, beloved, what that command is saying is that God is open to a conversation with you 24-7. Is that not an awesome thought? The God of the universe is 24-7 open and available to you to have a conversation. You can talk to God anywhere any day, any time. Wow, what an awesome invitation. What an awesome God. You can come to God anytime. Come to me, he says. Pray at all times. Like, uh, okay, so what does that look like? All right. You and I have these devices um, that we can call people and we have conversations. And the conversation begins and then there's this red button. I mean, I don't know how Android phones work, but there's this red button, all right? Y'all have a red button? Okay, there's this red button, and when the conversation's over, you hit the red button, and it's done, right? Well, with God, when you enter into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the conversation begins, and there's no red button. The conversation never ends. You get to commune with God, the living God, your maker, 24-7, all the days of your life, until you go meet him face-to-face. And then you get to commune with them forever. That's what it's like, okay? Plus, remember, we're praying as a strategy of war. The context of this passage is spiritual warfare. You're a soldier. We don't just pray to pray. We pray as a soldier. And it just makes sense if you want to be a good soldier. Some of you know this very well by experience. If you want to be a good soldier, then you need to keep in touch with the commanding officer so that you can know what your marching orders are for that day. It makes sense. And so as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, it would behoove us to keep in touch with him, our commanding officer, our Lord and Savior, so that we can receive our marching orders for the day and the power to execute them. That's why we pray at all times so that we can know and do the will of God. All right, so here's phrase by phrase. How do you pray first? All kinds of prayers. Secondly, all the time. Third, in the spirit. We pray in the spirit. Okay, so if there is a uh, format for biblical prayer, and I'm not a big formula format guy in the spiritual life, but if there is a biblical format for prayer, it's this. We pray to the Father, through the Son, in the spirit. That's how we pray, all right? Pray in the Spirit. Now, Pastor, what does, what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Great question. As I've thought about this, maybe it would help us uh, understand better what it means to pray in the Spirit if we contrast it with the opposite, which would be praying in the flesh. All right, praying in the flesh. Maybe you've done that. I'm sure I have too. Praying in the flesh means it's all about you, right? You're in the center of all your prayers, right? It's, uh, I want to talk about me, I want to talk about mine, I want to talk about number one, me, my, oh my, right? That's your prayer life. Did I quote that song right? Okay, right? So you're at the center of all your prayers. Or like what Jesus taught us in Matthew 16, like the Pharisees, they just pray these long, fancy, elaborate, glowing, really impressive to other people kinds of prayers, but it's still all about them. They're at the center. That's praying in the flesh. So now let's contrast that with praying in the spirit. Okay, who's at the center when we're praying in the spirit? God is. So in other words, we're not just talking to God. We're talking 
to God about God. We're talking to God for God. We're praying about the things that God cares about, that God wants to do in and through our lives. That's the spirit of praying in the spirit. It's God-centered. It's not centered on the flesh. It's centered on him, and that makes all the difference. So how do we do that, Pastor Sherm? Well, the Bible helps us in Romans 8. Here's what it says. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit, here it is, intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So this is how to pray in the Spirit. First notice, let's just be honest, you and I, when we come to God, we have to posture ourselves with humility. We come and we pray because he's God and we're not. So the Spirit helps us in our weakness. First thing we have to do is you come to him and say, Lord, I'm weak. You're strong, I'm weak. That's why we pray. And then if you're ever kind of held up in prayer, like, man, I don't need, Lord, I don't know what to pray about. I don't know what's going on. Well, the Spirit is there to help you. He's there to help you. He intercedes for you. Is this not a wild thought? The Bible also in Romans 8 talks about how Jesus lives to make intercession for you. So this passage says that the Spirit intercedes for you. Is this not a wild thought? I hope you drink this in this morning. My beloved, God is praying for you. Wow. He's praying for you. Now, what's he praying for you about? Last line. The Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. God is praying for you that you would know and do his will. That's what he's praying for you for. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it talks about no one knows the thoughts of a person except the person's spirit within them. And aren't you glad? Oh man, I'm so glad. I've thought of this many times over the years. I'm so glad that my whole church family doesn't know all my thoughts because I would have to get a new job, right? No one knows the thoughts of a person except the person's spirit within them. Then it goes on to say, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Makes sense. But then it goes on to say, and you've been given the spirit. May I remind you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you have been given the Spirit of God who knows the thoughts of God. He's within you. You want to know what God's thinking? The Spirit's there to help you in prayer. Pray about knowing and doing the will of God in your life. That's what praying in the Spirit is all about. All right? To, like Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done. Right? That's why we pray in the Spirit, to do no one do the will of God. Okay, so our three phrases on prayer. We pray all kinds of prayer at all times in the spirit. And then here's our fourth phrase. As we're praying, it says, to be alert with all perseverance. So this is how we pray. King James translates it, watching thereunto. It literally means to be sleepless, to stay awake, or be attentive. Physically, that's a terrible thing. Anybody ever had sleepless nights? Ugh, miserable. Spiritually, a good thing. To be awake, to be alert, to persevere, to pray and keep on praying, to watch thereunto. This, beloved, is how we fight our battles. We watch and pray. Do you remember the story? Jesus is nearing the end of his earthly ministry. He's exhausted. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He is about to be betrayed and handed over. But before he does, he goes to pray. And he prays and he says, you guys stay here and pray. I'm going to go over here and pray. And he goes over there and pray and he comes back. And what are the disciples doing? Sleeping. So he approaches the apostle Peter, and this is what he says in Mark 14. Watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray. This is how we fight our battles. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, this is how you battle temptation. Matter of fact, beloved, may I remind you, you have three enemies of your soul. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Eric did a masterful job last week talking about our enemy, the devil. This morning, let's talk about the world and the flesh. The Bible says in the book of James that this is a religion that God our Father sees as pure and faultless to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. There is pollution in this world that is trying to pollute your soul. 
It's the enemy of your soul. The Bible says in Romans 12, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. There is a pattern and a pollution in this world that's trying to seep into your soul to corrupt it. It's an enemy of your soul. But also, you know what, quite frankly, you and I are our own enemy sometimes. That's the flesh. That's the part that is enticed by sin. The way to battle the world and the flesh and the devil is by watching and praying. What does that mean? That means we watch out for those enticements. We watch out for what Pastor Eric taught us last week, the fiery darts of the enemy. We watch out for those. The enemy knows our weak spots. We stay alert and watch out for those before we pray. We watch as we pray for the Spirit's movement as we're praying. And then we watch after we pray for how God answers. We watch and pray. You remember in the book of Nehemiah, our ancestors in the faith gave us a great example of this. You remember the story goes that Nehemiah gets shipped out, but then as he's serving a king in a foreign land, he hears word back in his homeland that the wall of Jerusalem has fallen down and he has this really great burden to go back and rebuild the wall. So he goes back to rebuild the wall and he's just this masterful leader and they're, they're really knocking it out, but not everybody's happy about that. And here's how the rest of the story goes in the book of Nehemiah. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Isn't it interesting? Some things change, some things stay the same. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But, I love this, we prayed to our God and posted guard day and night to meet this threat. We prayed and posted guard. We, Moses on the mountaintop and Joshua in the valley. We prayed and posted guard. This is how we fight our battles. We pray and we wield the sword of the spirit. We watch and pray. That's how you overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil as a good soldier of Jesus Christ is by watching and praying. Beloved, when you and I watch and pray, what we do is we take the battles of this world and we elevate them. We like change the battlefield. One of you taught me this. You posted something on Facebook and it gripped me. And I found a video that I think that illustrates it. It was was an eagle grabbing hold of a snake and carrying it up into the heavens. It changed the battlefield. It didn't fight the snake down here. It fought it up in the heavens. And so I went on YouTube and I found a video of this and I want to show it to you. It's about a minute long and I hope you haven't had breakfast because you're about to watch an eagle eat a snake. All right? Okay, watch this. Awesome. This snake isn't about to play the victim. As the eagle flies towards the nest with her prize, the snake starts to fight back. Even in midair, he can bite. If he manages to inject his venom, he could kill his abductor. But biting an enemy in midair isn't easy, especially for a creature that spends most of its time in the water. For this snake, it's too little too late. Victory! Especially when facing down a hungry (laughs) eaglet. There you go. Victory over the dang snake. I hate snakes. Hey, beloved, it would have been foolish for that eagle to fight the snake in the water. It's at home in the water. It's powerful in the water. It's slitherier in the water. So what did it do? It took it up. Where the snake isn't as powerful or slithery, and it has victory. In the battles of your life, in your battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, watch and pray and change the battlefield. Take it up. Now you've got the power and the victory through Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, that's how to pray, our four phrases. You pray all kinds of prayers all the time. You pray in the spirit 
and you be alert. You pray with, let's call it attentive perseverance, all right? That's how to pray. Now, Pastor Sherm, what do I pray about? Great question, last phrase. Let's, Paul, let's have the Apostle Paul answer that. What do we pray about? End of verse 18. Pray for all the saints. And pray, he, he adds, in my behalf, that speech may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I love that. Pray for all the saints and especially let's pray for those who are advancing the kingdom of God, who are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel means good news. And here's the good news, that God is holy, but we are not. And there's nothing we could do about it, but God, in his mercy, in his grace, in his love, and in his kindness, reached down to us and gave us this ultimate gift through his only son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross in our place for our sin so that we wouldn't have to bear the punishment of our sin. He took it for us. And for all of us who would simply receive that gift by faith, we can be rescued out of the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of love and of redemption. And now you can have the security knowing that you're gonna be able to have this eternal conversation with God, not only in this life, but in the life to come. That's the gospel. We think that's the greatest news in the history of the world, and we just want to give everyone in the world the opportunity to hear it. So pray for, pray for missionaries and ministers. Pray for pra, uh, pastors and preachers who are advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ into the dark regions of the world. And also, man, let's pray for each other. He says, pray for all the saints. Pray for all the Christians around the world. Man, if we would just do that, an image came to mind as I was thinking about this. If we would just do that, we would have a testudo battle formation like the Romans used to. You, you familiar with this? Let me show you this. This is, the Roman legions used to fight like this. That's called testudo. It means tortoise in Latin. You can see this, that they would use their shields. Last week, Pastor Eric talked about the shield of faith. They would use their shields not only to protect them, but to protect each other. In the military, some of you are in the military, you guys, uh, especially you pilots, you talk about, I've got your six, which means I've got your back. But in this formation, man, I don't just have your six, I've also got your three and your nine and your noon. I got it all, right? I got you all covered in prayer. Man, if, if every follower of Christ would pray for all the saints, this would be our battle formation. This is how we could advance the gospel, advance the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God around the world. So my beloved, this is how we fight our battles. With prayer on the mountaintop and the sword of the spirit in the valley. We pray and we post guard. Amen? All right, let's pray. Let's do this. So Lord, indeed, we pray for missionaries and ministers, pastors and preachers everywhere around the world who are advancing the greatest news that you've given us, the gift of your son. May, like the Apostle Paul said, may they preach it boldly. And then we also pray for all the saints around the world that they would be faithful to follow you today. Purge us Purge your church today of anything that doesn't belong in it. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. Purge us and fill us then with your spirit that we may not only know your will, but have the power to do it today. And we ask it for the glory and in the great name of our Savior and coming King, Jesus Christ. Amen.